So again, hello, everybody. Welcome to those of you who came in in the middle of the rambling. Um, we are just getting started and taking a moment for everyone to join us. Uh, I'm Hadar Suskind. I'm the president and CEO of Americans for Peace Now, and I am thrilled to have you with us on this lovely Wednesday morning. Um, I am extremely pleased to be joined today by my friend and colleague, Donna Mills. Donna is, as you probably all know at this point, and correct me if I get the title wrong, the interim executive director of mm -hmm. our friends and colleagues at Peace Now, at Shalom Akhshav. Um, we've got a lot of things to talk about today, Donna. Um, I think what I'd like to do is give us a little frame to start, and then, I, then I'll hand it over to you. But, you know, I think we're coming together to take a look at really broadly this political moment in Israel. And so sitting where we sit today, you know, we look back at the last year at the Bennett Lapid government, how they governed, what it meant vis-a-vis -vis the occupation, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, relations or lack thereof, perhaps with, uh, with the Palestinian Authority, with Palestinians broadly. Um, and then we look, you know, currently at this moment of transition to a Lapid-led government, um, but an interim government that's going to go presumably until November 1st and those elections, you know, what are these four months going to look like? What might Lapid do? Um, what might he, you know, be, be open to? Because I think he has an opportunity to do something pretty unique, which is not tell us about what his leadership could be, but act, rather actually show us because he will be prime minister. Um, and then, of course, we want to look forward to the election. Um, I say look forward, maybe that's the wrong phrase. I don't know if anyone's really looking forward to the election, but we want to talk about it. Um, we want to talk about the fifth election in three years, um, what's happening, changes in the parties, who's coming, who's going, and what we think. Um, but before I turn it over to you for all of those pieces, I do just want to back up on the logistics again, remind folks that um, this webinar is going to be recorded. We will share that recording after the fact. So um, if you love it so much, you want to watch it again, or if you want to share it with friends and colleagues, uh, we will also turn it into an episode of PeaceCast, our podcast, and we will have a transcript as well. So we will share all of those. Um, and as we move through the conversation, we welcome your questions. Uh, the way to do so is to use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, please uh, click on the Q&A and type in the questions, and we will take as many of those as we can. Thank you very much. And with that, um, I am going to hand it over to Donna. Take it away. Okay, thank you all for joining, and good afternoon from sunny and very humid Tel Aviv. So I will start by saying that history repeats itself. First is tragedy, second is fast, and third is another version of Israeli election. Uh, I'm sure you had these discussions in the past, and I'll try my best to give uh, um, a spotlight on what's very unique at this time, because there have been very manifold elections, and we can talk also about the instability of the political system in Israel uh, and how that's related to the core work that Peace Now does every day. Um, so I will talk, first of all, about this, what was unique about this government, what was bad about this government, and why it's falling is really important to us at Shalom Akshav and at Americans for Peace Now. Um, just over a year ago, um, what was then termed, ironically, the government of change came together, which comprised a coalition very broad from the center and even right, Yamina, which is called literally right wing, um, to, I would say, the liberal left. So Meretz, a party uh, that has anti-occupation activists, including two former executive directors of Peace Now, all sitting in one coalition. This is something that had never really in that way happened in Israel. And it signaled coming back into a discourse, a political discourse that was very different to 13 years under Netanyahu's government. Now, regardless of one's political opinions around right versus left in terms of economics, in terms of the occupation, et cetera, um, Netanyahu led to a very um, centralist, a very authoritarian form of government. Of course, the discourse around corruption, his trial is now ongoing and taking attention from actual political issues because everyone is engaged in a political trial rather than talking about what's happening in the country. And suddenly we had this government that for, for nothing better even did its job. So there were ministers who looked at what their offices was meant, were meant to do. There was a budget for the first time in many years. Um, there was some kind of feeling of normalcy. 
And I should say that this government is historical for a very important reason to us, which is that it's the first time that a Palestinian party of those who consider themselves Palestinian citizens of Israel sat in a coalition. This is, you know, it never happened before in Israel, and it's really important. And that is Ram. So in terms of Israeli-Palestinian relationships within the Green Line, within the 1948 border, this was a very important watershed moment. Now, this was like the short shrift of the good. Now I'll talk about the bad, and then we'll end with the ugly, which is the elections. Um, peace now. Um, I feel I am the Cassandra of the Israeli left, where I come and say bad things, and then they come and materialize. But it's also our job to fight them and to make sure they don't happen. So your support of Americans Peace Now and Peace Now helps me to stop of all my bad fortunes coming true. Um, and I should say, when this government came into being, we were mildly optimistic, a feeling that is quite unknown to us on the Israeli left. And we felt that we had partners we could work with, including two ministers from Meretz, uh, several ministers from the Labour Party, including a former activist of peace now, Omer Barlev, who was a minister of defense. And we thought in terms of settlement expansion, in terms of internal security for Palestinians and Israelis, in terms of just reducing the level of um, I should say structural violence, things will be better. However, we published not so long ago a report that talked about, the, its title was, spoiler alert, a government of unequivocal annexation. So we saw that this government in a very ironic and weird way managed to escalate trends around um, settlement building, whether it's building settlements in places that are very dangerous and detrimental for the two-state solution, such as E1 and E2, um, expansion of outposts, illegal outposts. We're looking at just actually, it's, it was announced, and this government is still in sitting. I, I should remind you, on the 20th of July, 10 new outposts are being founded in broad daylight. Now imagine that new illegal outposts are being founded, no one is doing anything about it. Um, for us, Peace Now, we usually, as you probably know, focus on settlement expansion, but in this report, we also looked at structural violence. Now I'm sure a lot of you watched with horror and shame. Um, the, the funeral of Shirin Abu Akhle, really important figure, both in international journalism for the Palestinian struggle. The violence that was executed in her, in her funeral, let alone her actual killing that is now being disputed and discussed, um, was really shocking, you know, regardless of any opinions around the occupation, etc. Similarly, very hard Ramadans, um, very violent in Jerusalem, a lot of violence around um, Temple Mount Haram Sharif. So places where we hope to see some um, stabilization or some retreat from violence on the ground, we did not see that. Um, so I should say, whenever I spoke about this government when it was its sitting, I kind of felt torn because as, a, and as, an, as an Israeli citizen, I was pleased to have a government that actually went to work. That was a novelty, it was a nice change away from totalitarianism, away from populism, something that I know, um, you know, we struggle against for a while. Um, but then again, when we looked at policies to do with the occupation, that actually became much, much worse on the ground. So for us, Peace Now, our job was never more urgent to sort of shed light on these issues and to say, look, we might be happy that Netanyahu is not in office, we are. We might be happy that we're moving away from the government that we had in the past, again, we are. And yet this is just not good enough. And the fear of the sort of right wing just completely, I should say, um, brought the, the center left to a standstill. And what happened was that this government was founded on the agreement of political status quo, meaning no changes to the right or left, no peace talks, but not no annexation. And what happened was that we saw a lot of annexation de facto, meaning on the ground, settlement expansion, meaning taking places that are really important for the two-state solution, while the left just didn't do anything. So we didn't see the left sort of trying to push the boundaries and saying, I will go to Ramallah, I will, you know, we will push on our side. But we saw the right kind of pushing more to the right. John, I, I want to ask one specific thing in this, because I actually yes. think it's one of the fundamental, it, perhaps the fundamental challenge that the, again, the sort of previous government faced, right? You, you said it, they had this status quo doctrine that was specifically about Palestinians, right? It wasn't status quo on everything overall. No, no, no. Just, um, yeah. But I, I think that there was a fundamental either disagreement or misunderstanding, I would say, about what status quo meant. Because you could look at status quo and say, well, that means no changes. So no changes on the one hand mean no big peace talk, but it also 
No changes would mean no new settlements, right? No settlement yeah. expansion, no you know evictions from home. Like status quo would mean we are not changing yeah. where things stand, which is I think was the was the Idea. perspective or the belief of folks on the left in in the government yeah. and out. Whereas I think folks on the right, again, in the government now said status quo, and they looked at that as status quo of the Netanyahu policies is that we will continue doing exactly what we were doing, which is yeah. expelling people from their homes, expanding settlements, et cetera. And that fundamental misunderstanding, I think is really key to how we got to where we are now. Exactly, so that, that's a really helpful point there. And I think what we are facing, and we all work together against the, the challenge of annexation when that was a threat that was ongoing. What we see now is a move from the Euro annexation to de facto annexation, which means building, which means expansion of settlement, which means expansion of Israeli law in certain areas. And there are various arguments that are being used around, around it, whether it's natural growth, whether it's, you know, people need more space to live, etc., etc. But in the end of the day, it is de facto annexation. And in reality, what happened that was that the status quo was de facto annexation, meaning build more, annex more, develop more, evict more, demolish more, demolish, demolitions were also up under this government, rather than stopping what had been going on before. So I think it's really important for us, and again, because we have this joint history of working against the, the EU annexation, to understand that annexation is still a threat. And it's actually, I would say, a more difficult threat, because it, it is something that happens on the ground, it needs a lot of monitoring, it needs interventions on a daily basis, rather than a big threat of annexation. Um, so that's a really helpful intervention. Thank you for that. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about how the government fell through, um, which is a really important part also of where we are politically and where this election is going to. So the really, um, I mean, Netanyahu did a lot of very bad things around Israeli society, but the, I think the worst thing that he did in terms of our joint agenda is to completely depoliticize the occupation. I mean, you can go through your daily life, you can read the papers and you would hardly see anything to do with Palestinians, human rights, you would hardly see anything to do with settlements. Bringing issues to, agenda, to the agenda is really hard these days, whereas when he took office, that was not the case. So um, it, talking about the occupation in itself is becoming much, much harder. And what happened in a really interesting way is that um, the, there is a thing called the regulations for Judea and Samaria, which is a whitewashed name of settlements in Palestine, I should say. And the idea is that um, settlers, of course, legally are not residents of Israel. I mean, your friends in DC, New York, wherever you're joining us from today, who are Israelis and live abroad, are not subjects of Israeli law. I lived in Oxford for 13 years. I was not the subject of Israeli law. However, settlers who live on the occupied West Bank have to be somehow made subjects of Israeli law, otherwise they're subjects of no state, right? You know, because there's no Palestinian state yet. And so there are these emergency regulations that are extended on um, a regular basis. One of the biggest faults of the Israeli political system that leads to its instability is the fact that a lot of it is founded around emergency regulations. Some of them are inheritance from the British mandate. You know, a lot of legal structures in the state itself are problematic. And this is one of them. And we got to the stage where if these regulations hadn't been extended, then basically all settlers would be citizens of no state. And um, it was actually the debate around that that brought the government down and the lack of agreement and lack of ability to come to a consensus around that. I mean, the government was working with a very small majority as it is, has to be said. But it's fascinating that on the one hand- So, so really, small that it wasn't actually a majority at some point. No, 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 exactly. Yeah. Uh, uh, but I mean, um, it, it's hard enough to sort of bring the occupation to the agenda. And yet it was the occupation that brought the government down and the inability to bring um, this to a vote to actually extend them. And there was this great fear that if they won't be extended, then what will happen here? And I mean, just an example of what it would mean if those regulations would be extended. There are several judges in the Supreme Court who are um, residents of settlements. By the way, they often sit on legal appeals that we file. Imagine what the implications are for a peace now petition on settlement expansion where the judge who sits in the case is a settler himself. Um, and our legal advisor, the really wonderful Michael Svald said to me, well, if the regulations are extended, then these are my next three cases postponed because the judges can't sit in the Supreme Court. So it goes from 
judges in the Supreme Court to being able to go to really everything to do with- Just to end that, they can't sit on the Supreme Court because they're not, they wouldn't be citizens of the state. No, no, yeah. exactly. You know, in the same way that your Israeli neighbor in New York can't be a Supreme Court judge in Israel. Um, so this is how the government fell apart, which I think is very symbolic of, of the kind of political rut we're in. And just to wrap up my comments and to sort of segue into talking about the elections, one of the greatest ills that we need to handle here is really not talking about the core problems of the political um, crisis, which, you know, it, I can't really call it a crisis because something that goes on for so long is not a crisis. Um, but it's just the inability to bring to the surface the, the structural instabilities, the uh, legal irregularities, all the kind of fundamental issues within the Israeli political system that enable it to be an occupying power. We just marked 55 years of occupation, you know, temporary occupation, so-called, and yet to try and function as a democracy. Now, Peace Now's slogan has been for a while, there's no such thing as democracy with an occupation. If you occupy a foreign people, um, military occupation for so long, you cannot act as a democracy. And I think you can see the kind of shockwaves of that coming back and sort of part of what we're seeing now is this. However, sadly, and this is kind of a good way to talk about the elections also, it's not that, you know, the um, political regulations in Judea and Samaria or the occupation or violence towards Palestinians is now taking front pages news. And it's not that it's becoming an issue that people are more concerned about. You know, the occupation continues to be an issue that is on the periphery of most people in Israel, as well as parties, sadly, um, which is, you know, why we're pushing really hard from outside of the parliament, from outside of the political class, um, to bring the occupation to the forefront of the discussion, because we believe that, again, there's no such thing as democracy with an occupation. Yeah. Donna, before you move on to the next part, uh, mm -hmm. two questions have come in that I just think you, you could perhaps answer quickly. So one, yeah. you, met, you mentioned this, you know, the extension of Israeli law over to, to settlers. Um, it's generally referred to as, as the settlement law or by a lot of people as the apartheid law. Um, one, can you just give people an update sort of where that is and where where that stands? And then there's a question that came out of that also um, asking if Palestinians in the occupied territories are also citizens of no state, because you talked about how if this was not reauthorized that the Jewish settlers would be citizens of no state. So can you take a minute on those two things before we move to the next piece? Okay, so the first part is less interesting. The second part is more interesting. Um, the moment that the Knesset is dissolved, there is an automatic extension of the re regulations. So instead, it's very symbolic of the Israeli political system. Instead of debating something that is contentious, that is difficult, we'll do some kind of political maneuver and then there'll be this kind of sudden extension. And I mean, there's been all sorts of political maneuvers also to enable, obviously, the settlers to be able to vote in the election. Um, so there's nothing really insightful and interesting there, just again, a kind of um, political gymnastics, I should say, to, to make things work for the settlers, which is a core thing that we learned this government. Um, the settler lobby, lobby can make things work for them, even though they're still a minority, a very small minority in Israeli society, they have really disproportionate power in the political system. Now, the question of Palestinians, which country are they citizens of? So of course, there's the Palestinian Authority, um, we know that last May, when we saw a really terrible escalation here, one of the causes around it was the question of whether or not there'll be elections in the Palestinian Authority, whether or not East Jerusalem um, residents can vote in the elections. Um, those who live in East Jerusalem, Palestinians who live in East Jerusalem, are actually citizens of no state. They cannot vote for the Knesset. They cannot vote for the Palestinian Authority. So they are de facto and the Euro annex, annex. So when you look at what's happening in East Jerusalem, including the evictions, demolitions, et cetera, this is a microcosm of what could happen on a larger scale if we progress in the way that we do. And what it means to hold people under occupation is really to take away from them their very basic political and civil rights. It means the right to vote. It means the right to stand for elections. The Palestinian Authority is not a state. It's been recognized only by you know, a very small number of states as a political state. Um, and until Israel really moved towards this two-state solution and recognized Palestine as the, of course, international recognition, including the US, Palestinians will not have any political rights, which they currently do not have. 
Okay. So let, let, let's keep going now. I mean, do, do you want to yeah. go in? I, I think, you know, we want to make sure we talk about sort of the current government. Actually, here's what I'd like to do. Another yeah. question just popped up that I think is interesting. As we talk about these next few months with Lapid as prime minister, you mm -hmm. know, somebody somebody just asked, said, should Lapid be believed when he said today that there would be no new settlements under his government? Especially, given, well, right, especially given the fact that, you know, we've got 10, you know, illegal settlements. And, and just to be clear, that distinction of illegal is, you know, under international law, all settlements are illegal. Yeah. When we refer to them as illegal settlements, we're talking about ones that are illegal, even under Israeli law. Yeah. So what would you say to the that question particularly, but also about what we, you know, what we should be hoping for, scared about, thinking of, you know, over these next few months and Lapid's leadership? Okay, so, um... Be saying very gently, no, it is wrong to say that there were no new settlements. Um, there was a 26% increase with the promotion of plans for 7,292 housing units and settlements, which is compared to Netanyahu, 5,784 units in the Netanyahu governments. And this is an average between 20, 2012 to 2020. Um, in terms of tenders, um, the Bennett and Lapid government issues 1,550 housing units, 62% um, jump in construction starts, which means kind of we can't, we work with uh, the Central Bureau of Statistics data, which looks at the actual beginning of um, building. Um, the statistic goes on in terms of demolitions, in terms of evictions. So in all relevant um, data, we see an increase. It's not true to say that this is to do with natural growth. Again, when you compare to the Nat Netanyahu government, 62% increase is not natural growth. So Anna, again, can you clarify what tenders are? Yes, tenders is basically um, giving legal permission to begin buildings. So it's the first stage before starting a building plan to give you know, your construction. It's the, it's the approval, but not the actual construction. Exactly, yeah. So you have different stages. You have the plan, then you have the tenders, and then you have the starts, which is seeing actually houses or beginning of houses. So in all these factors, we saw an increase, which is you know to say that nothing that had been said um, is actually true. But in terms of what we can expect, and I think here we need to be very cautious, but we can also be you know look into the future more optimistically and say. This is the time to hold Lapid into account. And as you said, um, he is now a prime minister. He's no longer a, a replacement. He is no longer in waiting. He is a prime minister. Um, anecdotally, as an interim executive director, I want to say to him, you can actually do things. You go into your job and you do your job. And I, I kind of wanted to write him a letter. Maybe I will one day. Um, so, you know, he can't stall things anymore. He can't say, oh, I'll do this in the next stage of the rotation. The excuses have run out. Um, in praise of Lapid, I should say, um, Lapid is an internationalist. He's a man who thinks globally. He knows many international leaders from his many years as a journalist. As a journalist. Um, he thinks beyond you know, this little area in which we live. And this makes a big difference when it comes to contention settlements plans. It makes a big difference when we talk about things such as settler violence, which also, by the way, we saw an increase under this government um, and lack of accountability. So in terms of what he can do, he can actually show us what the government looks like when it holds the settler lobby to account. It can show us what it means for Israel to act as part of other nations. You know. You mentioned, and I think it's a really important comment, that all settlements are illegal according to international law. By the Geneva Convention, transferring um, civilian population is a violation of human rights and of international law. So, you know, Lapid knows that. He is a very well-informed, well-versed politician with many years of advocacy under his belt, and he knows what will not fly. He knows that the international community will not accept certain things such as, for instance, the forced evictions from Masafiriata, a whole region in which entire villages are being displaced for a firing zone. Um, he knows that E1, which was supposed to be discussed on the 18th of July, now postponed to the 12th of September, the most detrimental plan for the two-state solution connecting um, Jerusalem and Ramallah, he knows what the implications of that. So it is really important to have him where he is and to have his agency, you know, without 
thinking of, oh, I will have to do this next month and then I won't be in office anymore, etc. Of course, during election, election season has started in full force and we have, you know, there's no hiding from it. And he thinks of his constituency. But it is to hope, and I do believe that he can actually shift a lot of people's thinking. He's very well esteemed in the Israeli society because he managed to form this government. He actually is the man who put this government together. Bennett was the first, Naftali Bennett was the first in the rotation between the two, but he took over um, as the man who formed the government and actually in an interesting way took the back seat. And I have to say, after 13 years of Netanyahu, having a politician who does not want to be in the spotlight, who does not want to give every single interview, who doesn't give an announcement on TV, you know, there was a long period where almost every evening for some random excuse, we had announcements from Netanyahu on TV at like 8 p.m. And suddenly having someone who is not doing that became really a breath of fresh air. Now he can use the status as the normal politician, the man who's bringing back Israel into a framework of the rule of law and talk about what it means to live in a country that um, abides by the rule of law. And part of that, and this is where I become a spoiled spot, is to say, is talking about the occupation, because it's not good enough to just pass a budget and talk about, you know, economic rehabilitation and fighting corruption and talking about democracy. If you're holding millions of people under military occupation, you cannot, you know, progress as a democracy. So he does have an opportunity, but it's a very big challenge at the same time. It is. And I think, you know, just to add a thought on that, you know, we, we put out um, some statements and we've been in touch with with Lapid and, and his folks. And I think, frankly, more importantly, from our seat with the U.S. government talking mm -hmm. about the fact that he really has this opportunity now. You know, most of the time you go into an election and you have, you know, people saying, well, this is what I will do if I'm given the opportunity, if yeah. if you elect me. And, you know, he's he's in the chair. He doesn't have to tell us what he might do. He can show us. Yeah. And, you know, both Lapid has stated repeatedly, including, you know, this week, his, his commitment to a two-state solution. And he's talked about, you know, he's talked about his belief in peace and in needing to take steps toward that. So, you know, while I, I'm being really honest, I wouldn't bet the mortgage, but I am, you know, hopeful that, you know, our voice here and your voice there and so many others, and particularly, again, the American government voice with President Biden coming to town soon, you know, can help, can help remind him that, um, A, that's his position and his party's position, but B, that, you know, going into election season doesn't always mean you have to lean as far right as you possibly can. And like you said, he does care about what the U.S. government thinks and what others think. So I think there is, you know, an opportunity here for us to all in our different capacities, raise our voices and encourage him to, I would, I would say, uh, be his best self. Certainly, I agree with that. And um, we do feel, and I have to say again, I am torn as both a citizen of this country and also uh, an active occupation and pro-peace activist, that this has not been a terrible year in everything that is to do with rehabilitation of political life. You know, my friend and comrade of Nel Goyal of Breaking the Silence talks about the process of DBization, of getting away from you know, the Netanyahu years. And yeah. I think it will take time. I mean, as I can say in this in this company, getting away from a, a, an authoritarian, populist, right wing leader takes a while, and we're only we're after twelve or thirteen years of that, depending on how you count. So, you know, this government has been important in many ways, but now is the time really for us to push the thing that we feel is the most important and also the most absent at the same time, which is the well, occupation. And the Donna, I can't see everybody who's on here with us, obviously. But I'm yeah. willing to bet that a lot of people sitting in the U.S. are shaking their heads right now, going, "Oh yeah, yeah." That, well, we yeah. know. I know. Yeah. Whenever I talk to my American friends, I kind of say, "You know, you know how you felt for four years, then three times." So that's what we're dealing with. Um, but I will say, and this is a little bit of optimism because I can't do this job without being a bit of an optimist. That you know, it is the civil society and the left broadly that has continued fighting um, that gives us hope and gives us courage to continue. And for us elections, I should say, it's interesting because we care about politics and it's interesting in terms of what we can and cannot do 
vis-a-vis -vis different government offices. But for us, our daily work doesn't change because settlement of construction continues and Palestinian human rights violations continue. Um, so, you know, our job really doesn't change that dramatically and we need all the help we can get now. You know, it doesn't change. The fact that the election doesn't mean that it's easier for us. Um, and then actually means that it's an opportunity because now all politicians want to be reelected and suddenly they're interested in talking to a lot of organizations, including ourselves. So it's an opportunity also to raise the things that we care about very deeply and to bring them to the public discourse. Um, so, so that's where yeah. we are in terms of that. That's a great segue though, because you just said, I agree with everything you've said this whole time, except for one thing, which you just said, all politicians want to be reelected. Because in fact, as we yeah. know, Naftali Bennett does not want to be elected, re-elected. Naftali so uh, yeah. Fledge does not want to be re-elected. Um, so for, well, for... not now. I, I, I will, okay, you know, fair. being a politician myself, I'll say not forever, you know, yeah, maybe they're taking a break but... now because they won't be elected now, but in four years, they'll make that comeback. We have four, seen that. Four before. years, please. Um, yes. I said I'm an optimist, you know, sure. this is how I keep going every day. Exactly. Um, so, yeah. so in all so serious, it's... though, let's talk about what, what we what know is happening? These, which is not everything yet, but what's happening? What are we seeing in terms of new faces coming and going, new parties, things merging, things moving? Yeah. What's what's the feel on the ground there? So, um, you know, they're always, because we are a multi-party system, which whenever I follow elections in other countries, I think, ooh, that meant it was not a good idea to put the system in that way. Uh, there are always some very random parties. And uh, my favorite, obviously, is the legalization of cannabis, which you know, after this election, we all need it. Sorry, I, sorry to be on the record on that. Um, but I think actually in terms of official party lines, we there are some talks about different mergers, et cetera, mostly on the right. I should say on the left, there are a little bit of leadership struggles that I'll talk about in a second, but um, there haven't been sort of a new parties announced. It will be interesting to see what happens to Ram. That was a breakaway party from the joint list, sat in the coalition, and actually sadly lost a lot of its power because it didn't have enough time to show its constituency what it could do. So it's one of those things when you look at public opinion surveys, Israeli citizens, uh, sorry, Palestinian citizens of Israel are deeply disappointed in Ram, and Jewish Israelis say, oh, but it was great to have a Palestinian party. Um, so it would be interesting to see what happens to them. The joint list is not so great that they're going to vote for them, but no. So you know, um, the joint list isn't doing as well as it might have done because other left parties aren't doing very well. Which is interesting to ask where are the left wing voters going? A lot of them are going to Lapid, as I mentioned. There's admiration to him for being the politician who brought normalcy back. Um, the Labour Party, as you probably will remember, is now headed by Merav Micheli, but she now has a challenger who is the secretary of the party, a man called Eran Khermoni, who is in all matters to do with occupation to the right of her. Um, Meretz, a party that is associated in some way or another, and many of its constituencies are also our constituencies, um, Meretz has suffered a very hard blow this election. Its leader, Nitzan Horowitz, um, I don't know if he already announced his, he will leave, but you know his chances of being re-elected, at least within the party, I think, aren't great. Um, he already has been challenged internally by uh, Ir Golan, who is a, a general, uh, but a very left-wing general, um, who became famous by making explicitly left-wing remarks while still being in the army, something that is very rare here. And I should say has been actually fairly decent and consistent on all things to do with occupation. So on our side, you know, he came with us actually to the protest we had in Eviatar in February, mm -hmm. and he supported some other issues we worked on. Um, he worked at so everyone at some point worked in Shalomoshal. That's you know, sometimes we tidy the office and we say, oh, he was here, she was there, he was here. Um, so that's what's happening on, I, I should say, like the social democratic left. Um, Isawi Fred, who was the Minister for Regional Co Cooperation, just mentioned yesterday that he's stepping down, actually after I saw him on the fourth, in the 4th of July party in um, Jerusalem, and has asked the Havagalon, the queen of the Zionist left, to return. She so far has said she will not do so or at least will not do, do so in open primaries. You know, it might be that if she is asked directly and no one else challenges that um, she will decide to return. I don't know. Um, so things are shaking up on the left. 
Um, I should say that the polls are not surprising in that they show that the political stalemate will continue. You know, we do see a shift, a slight shift to the right, but it's not more dramatic than the previous election. And we know that polls very often here are, are slightly jaded, more than slightly. Our most heavy concern, I should say, is Itamar Benfield, who is a far right um, terrorism enabler, um, racist, all other titles you'd like to choose. Um, and the probability of him actually joining one of the governments being formed, which would be hugely dangerous for all of us really who care about the rule of law, all of us who don't want to see a messianic right wing country taking over this, you know, at worst on the way to a democracy, at best a democracy in crisis, but something to do with a democracy that aspires to be a democracy, for him being a democracy is not a good thing. Um, so it is dangerous on many levels. And I should say, you know, this is where I put myself on the side and I say, I am a Jewish white woman. If Itamar Benfield is elected, my life won't change. If I were a Palestinian woman, my life would become a living hell. So we have to remember that the stakes are very different for different people in this country, and especially those who cannot vote and are still implicated by different policies um, that will be, you know, no doubt legislated under the new government. So in terms of threats, he definitely is the biggest threat. Ayala Chaked is um, doing consistently decently. You know, she was in Naftali Bennett's party, but she has always been the right wing signifier. She's an interesting woman. She comes from a secular home. Um, she is very anti-liberal. You know, in her opinions, she was um, in, in all her different positions. She managed to get a lot of anti-liberal work done. So, you know, when I'm being asked who is scary for me, you know, obviously Ben Kvir is a man who will go and incite violence on the street, but I'm also very worried about the electric kid who quietly and efficiently can change things within government offices. And, you know, I, I tend to think that fascism isn't better when it's polite and well-organized. It's actually more dangerous that way. So electric kid is another person to watch on the other side of the political map, um, very openly pro annexation, very openly pro, um, you know, depriving Palestinians of their political rights and having um, two legal systems within one um, territory, which is the international law definition of apartheid. And she is openly for that. So, you know, these are the kind of people who are up for running in this next election. Um, and Can I yeah. Two, two, two pieces. I have to ask about something else because it's too depressing to think about Ben Gvir and Shaked. Um, Gadi, uh, Gadi Eisenkopf. Mm. So new new name, right? Coming in. What do we think? Where where is he going to be? What's he going to do? And then also, you talked about some of the discussions on on the right about parties. I know there have been publicly discussions about labor and merits running together, which again publicly were sort of announced as we're not going to do that. But then my understanding is that there's still at least some conversation going on. So can you talk to us about Eisenkot one and then also sort of labor and merit in that voting block? Yeah, I mean, to start with Eisenkot, you know, uh, to be cynical, what we clearly need is another general because all the other ones worked really well for us. Um, he is supposed to be different. I don't know, I'll see. I, I, I'm a big believer, in, as you said about Lapid, when he does the job to see how well he does. A Gantz, which, which was supposed, who was supposed to be a kind of left liberal general, was the Minister of Defense and was by far the worst we had worked with in a long time. And so with Eisenkopf, it's unclear what his effect would be for us, for peace now. Um, it is rumored that he might be running with Gantz, which will probably strengthen Gantz. This is rumored that he's being courted by other parties. Lapid is clearly also interested. You know, he will be courted by the kind of center block. Right. Um, I doubt he will run with the properly left party. Um, right. so, people who always um, love to add another general. Yeah, because we're missing them in politics. You know, I have to say, as a woman also, I have to say, maybe Israel could do better in terms of democracy when it doesn't look to a man who held a gun to be the person who saves it out of its political fate. There can't be an argument made there. But, you know, maybe that's a bit too radical, but one has to say that. Um, in terms of government of parties joining forces, yes or no, you know, the only thing I can say that is impossible in Israeli politics is saying that something is impossible in Israeli politics. So, you know, the fact that certain parties say they won't join forces, we know that in the past there was in one of the many elections um, over the past five years, three years rather, um, there was a joint list that had uh, 
very sadly, Meretz and the Labour Party and Oli Levy, who then so sadly segued back to the right and is now kind of she hops between parties. Um, that didn't do them a lot of good electorally, which is, I'm guessing, something that they're thinking about now. Very sadly, Meretz, it looks like, is on the verge of not passing. So, you know, that's something that I'm sure people are thinking about in terms of joining forces with other parties. The Labour Party isn't doing that badly in the polls, but isn't doing brilliantly either. So the question is, who wins, who loses of such um, so, unification? Uh, yes, pardon the interruption. There's a question that just goes perfectly with this. So, yeah. you know, one of the questions is, what's the chances of a truly Arab Jewish party will emerge that's presumably from the factions of merits and the joint list and what do you think about that conceptually? So, I mean, as we're talking about the different possible yeah. configurations, I, and just to note, you know, Meretz was and is, you know, had both Jewish and Arab members. Does yeah. that make it truly an Arab Jewish party? I think that's a difficult position to yeah. argue for. So That's a great question. Thank you for asking us that. Um, I think one has to hope. And again, when talking about this government, there were a lot of things that didn't work, but actually having a Palestinian party in the government Having a Palestinian leader speak openly in forums, you know, whether it's the Haaretz Convention, whether it's other places where you have a voice from Palestinian Israeli society that had been absent for as long as the country had, had lived, really, and it was really transformative and very important. And I should say again, as I said, in terms of polling, et cetera, just for Jewish people to hear a voice that is never heard, and to hear what it means to be a Palestinian citizen of Israel. Um, I should say to that question, that is the hope of many of us that, and it could be, you know, not to be too cynical, but not this election, but the next election or the one after next, because we know, you know, the country is deeply in this inst unstable situation. So not in November, but like in March. Um, sorry. Yeah, next November, you know, or like next summer. I was just hoping not for a summer election because it's really too hot, you know, so I did the British winter election of 2019. I will not go and I went in the rain. I don't want to do the sun again. Um, an election that will come up. And I think, you know, if I am a firm believer in the longer view of history and when you think about processes and how they start. So we had a government that had Palestinian citizens of Israel in it. And then you had other people who kind of were able to hear those voices. And then you had other Palestinian politicians who were able to, you know, talk more openly about various issues. So the hope is that, again, what this question asks will happen at some point. Well, it will not happen this election, I think. And if it happens in this election, it will happen in the same format that it happened now, which is, you know, it's kind of a bad pastiche of identity politics to say, oh, oh, we need a Palestinian, come. If you're a Palestinian woman, even better. You know, that's what happened in Meris. It was a woman who was um, Jida Zouabi, who was basically put in a place that was very high on the list without anyone really talking to her, knowing what her opinions were and how she would vote in the future. Um, so, you know, maybe just putting people in places because of their identity isn't the way to change the discourse in society, but at least that conversation has started, which is, again, a new moment for us. So that's a yeah. really important intervention. All right, I got two questions I wanna throw at you now. Yeah. So one, which I, we should probably start with first because it's specific to this. Again, we mentioned the D, BB of negation of, of the government overall and you know the important role that this government has played. Obviously, as we've been talking about different parties and different leaders to different people in this election, you know, Netanyahu's running. He's he's pushing. He's I, yeah. I would say back. I mean, unfortunately, he hasn't left yet. So, you know, what do you think about um, you know, his his chances? And, mm -hmm. and I would say specifically, you know, he's under indictment for three charges of corruption, um, you know, and it's not a theoretical, I mean, the, the, you know, we're not gonna go down the rabbit hole of talking about the trial, but the trial's going on, this is a thing, there is not a single voter in Israel who doesn't know all of those facts. And yet he is, you know, polling at or, or very near the top. So what do we have to say about Netanyahu and the possibility of his return? Not what do we think about it, we know that, but sort of, you know, looking at what the average Israeli voter thinks about it. So let, let's start with that. Okay, so um, Netanyahu has been a long-term player, obviously, and has changed the terms of discourse here. Um, I think actually the interesting processes that are happening, and this is not me talking about from the Shalom Achaf point of view, but just in terms of political realpolitik, 
is mm -hmm. him being challenged within the Likud, because a lot of people within the Likud itself are realizing that he can be dangerous for the party, the indictments uh, charges stand, you know, if he goes to prison, what happens with the party then? So, you know, even within the party and his kind of long-term followers, there have been some disputes and there have been challenges and sort of thinking, you know, there will be primaries. We know who will win the primaries, you know, sure as the sun rises in the east, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the, there are some challenges internally um, in terms of him being elected, so again, this goes back to the question of stalemate and to sort of remind that because we're talking about trying to form a coalition with a majority, actually in terms of the numbers, he won't have an overwhelming majority. He might have a majority of one or two. Once again, we'll have an unstable government. There'll be some kind of political crisis. We'll go to an election again. So I can't see him coming back into like another 13 years of political rule. But as I said, nothing is impossible in um, Israeli politics. Um, what is really important here, and I should say this is something that we've, Shalom Ashav, been working on, is the change of discourse within Israeli society around Netanyahu, and especially the anti-corruption and pro-democracy protests that have been ongoing for the past three, four years even, um, that had focused on him as a figure, but generally talking about the corruption of the system. Now, we, Shalom Ashav, are working very closely with central activists from that movement, and um, you know, just tying together the two issues of occupation and corruption and talking about the kind of the close alignment. We look at other countries such as South Africa, where again, the anti-apartheid struggle and the anti-corruption struggle really went hand in hand and the issue of corruption is still very much dominating um, the news there. So the ties between you know, ruling over a different people and having a corrupt political system are very, very close tied. Um, it might and it might not be that we'll see more anti netanyahu protests. I know that, that you know, internal information, there have been rearrangements and like people are getting ready for that. Right. It depends on, of course, on how well he does and what is his chances according to the polls, et cetera. But um, why, what will he do in the future? How possible it is that he stays in his position, you know, everything is possible. In terms of the indictments um, and the fact that he's polling well, I mean, the, the, I have to say that um, media here is, I lived, as you probably noticed from my accent, I lived in the UK for 13 years where the media is very right wing. Um, the media here is not as bad, but it's still fairly, um, fairly biased. We do not have CNN or the New York Times, sadly. We have Haaretz, which is a very good newspaper and yet isn't able to counter all the trends seen here. Um, the main panelist on the Friday night news, the most important news um, really cast of, of the week is Amit Segal, who is a very right wing caster. And he is the most important political voice in, in the system here. So this is a system that is very leaning to the right. That the media is very biased in what it sort of brings about. The discussion around um, around the trial and it's in itself so, sorry you probably hear siren going through um welcome to living in tel aviv so you know the fact that he is doing still well is to do with also the media communicating not all the things that it could communicate i should say that gabby lasky who was once executive director of peace now my personal inspiration for many years great human rights lawyer tried to pass a law that would stop someone who is um under indictment charges from running to office. And that was stopped, be surprised, all act shocked and surprised, and was not put forward in the outgoing Knesset. So there has been an attempt to stop that structurally, but at the moment there is no law that prohibits him from running. Okay, um, we've got, I'm just looking at the time. I think we, we have time for one more topic that I wanna make sure we get to, and maybe we'll mm. squeeze some other questions. Um, and, uh, and that's the Biden visit I wanna talk about a little bit. Um, yeah. Obviously, President Biden is on his way to come see you. Um, you know, he will he will be there soon. Again, we mentioned it briefly. You know, we have been uh, working closely with folks at the State Department and the administration here. You know, sharing our views and the broader progressive views on this in terms of what we want to see um, him raise with with Lapid, with other political meter, leaders, um, other things we want to see them do. But I'm curious. You know, what do you think? in terms of the Biden visit, do you think it is uh, is gonna have, you know, he's gonna be received by Prime Minister Lapid? Do you think there will be some political impact in that? Um, and how is it being, uh, you know, thought about on the Israeli side? 
so it's a very sensitive time for Biden, President Biden, obviously, to come over because we're mid-election or just the beginning of an election campaign. Um, we know very well this visit isn't about the occupation or the peace process. It's about basically a stopover on the way to Saudi, um, and it's about the Iran deal. So there are issues that are, will be discussed that have nothing to do with the topics that we work on. Nevertheless, obviously, it's an opportunity. We have Lapid, who, as you said, is a two-stater sitting in government, and there is a possibility to challenge him and say, you now have the power to stop all these terrible things from happening. I should say that the E1 hearing was meant to be on the 18th of July and was conveniently pushed down the road to September, which means that there is awareness that this will be a time not to do things that are volatile. Now, the question is, from our point of view, not to just push those issues that are sensitive during Biden's visit to do it another time, but just not to do them at all. But this is what we're trying to do. Um, I think this is a significant visit because obviously any visit of um, an American president is an important thing for us. I should say, you know, we all know of the special relationship between the US and Israel, and there, it's always a very exciting moment for us. And, you know, we are also, there is a feeling of camaraderie between everyone who went through the Biden campaign and seeing him elected after the years of Trump. And again, there, there are parallels between Lapid and Biden as the man who brings normalcy after a long and hard period. And I think that will probably resonate. You know, there, there might be even between them this kind of feeling of like, hey, what does it feel like to have it to, to sort of clear up all of this? Um, we know that also um, President Biden is dealing with a lot of internal pressures. Um, and I do want to send my sincere solidarity at this moment, you know, in light of really terrible news of mass shootings, um, as well of uh, as trying to reinstate Roe versus Wade. So a lot of internal issues that will be on his mind when he comes here and looks at what's going on here and says, what can I do with this place? Um, but I do think it's an opportunity. Again, we have two men who are in not a very dissimilar position in many ways, um, who are committed to the same values, who are committed to a long-term political resolution of the conflict and ending the occupation as a way to achieve it. Um, so my hope is that at some point during the conversation, this will be brought up and that, you know, Lapid can be held to be accounted, accountable. Um, so, so that's kind of the hope around that. And I, I think it will be a very sensitive visit because, again, President Biden can't be seen to endorse one candidate over another. And Lapid will be doing his own election campaign. It's already been resented from the right saying, you know, Lapid will get this indefinite airtime <laughs> and kind of which is, you know, unfair, but there you go. Um, so that's kind of where we stand around this visit. Um, you know, it is important to say that in the past, when high ranking political figures had come here and asked for certain things to happen, such as um, Secretary Clinton, when asked to stop demolitions in East Jerusalem, that happened. Uh, Pierce, uh, during the Obama visit, I know other things have been requested and happened. So, you know, it has happened in the past that high ranking political American officials, including the rank of president, were able to get things done. So we hope that will happen as well. Yeah. And again, you know, without without digging into the details too much, that's certainly what we have been communicating to the administration here, that they've got a moment, they've got an opportunity. They have, frankly, a long list of policies that, you know, that this administration has has espoused and said that they stand for um, promises, frankly, that they made in the elections, uh, many of which have not been fulfilled yet. So we are hopeful that while while I agree with you that this is ultimately a stopover on the way to Saudi Arabia, uh, I'm hopeful that they will take this opportunity to to move in a positive direction. Right. It's not going to solve everything. It's not going to end the conflict, um, but it could do it, it could be a move in a positive direction. Speaking of moves in a positive direction, um, I am very pleased to welcome our APN board chair, Jim Klutznik, to the Zoom. Hello, Jim, how are you? Uh-oh, I think maybe Jim froze. Hello. Oh, there you go. Jim, you with us? Uh, I uh, temporarily was not with you. Okay. <laughs> so You missed so my I'm very good. clever introduction of you, but that being oh, said- Oh, well, you know, I, I missed the benefit of that and all. Have to depend on others to tell me that. Just, and I can see you and I got the memo today about the striped shirts. Yes, yes. Which means we're, we're which means we're ready to go to jail anytime on this issue. Just to let you know. Um, uh, 
So thank you for the introduction, Adar. I'll, I'll take that on faith. And uh, and Dan, always good to see you. And and uh, for those who are listening in with us today, I think what they have uh, demonstrated is how we of APN and 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 Shalom Akshab in Israel collaborate on a day-to-day, uh, -day, week to week basis on this. And and uh, we encourage you to support us, uh, both of us in that regard. Um, you know, I think the, um, uh, we, you know, we're, we're really looking for uh, a mutual uh, satisfaction among two sovereign people uh, to resolve this, this, uh, this conflict. And uh, I think uh, Dan made very clear today, uh, while uh, Israel continues to steal the land and homes and however they do it of the Palestinian people, our, our, uh, our partners, our colleagues in Shalom Akshav continue to spotlight that. And, uh, and while we work with our government, our administration and our, legis our legislators in the Congress uh, to try to promote the peace process because while it's stymied, uh, it just affords the, uh, the uh, Israelis to continue the steal of the land and we're looking to stop the steal, to use an American uh, expression, stealing it from people we don't respect a great deal. Uh, but that's, uh, so I thank all of you for joining us today. I thank Adar and, and Dana for demonstrating to our supporters uh, that they get great value by supporting this collaboration. And uh, thank everybody for listening to us today. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Jim, so much for joining us. Donna, as always, thank you for being with us and, and sharing your expertise and your analysis. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. And uh, we will hopefully see you all soon. Bye.